Reading from John chapter 20, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. And he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Verse 30, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let us pray. Father, we come to you this morning grateful for your word, grateful for the resurrection, the glorious truth that gives us ultimate hope. Father, I pray right now that as I stand in humility against these words, that you would guide them, that whatever I say would be pleasing to you, would bring glory and honor to you, and would be helpful to our people. Father, give us open minds, open hearts to receive your word this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. It's Easter. It's a big deal. He rose. If he didn't rise, we're wasting our time. Go home. It's a beautiful day. Cut your grass. It may take you two runs. This morning, we're going to talk about the ultimate restoration that we have in Jesus Christ. I love that word, ultimate. Ultimate carries with it a few different Meanings, first of all, there's ultimate in the sense of my ultimate or final destination. There's ultimate in the sense of the most, of the best or most extreme of its kind. Boxing isn't good enough. We need ultimate fighting, the UFC. All right, it's not just Frisbee, it's ultimate Frisbee. It is the ultimate deal of the century. And then finally, there's ultimate in the sense of what is most basic or fundamental, the ultimate truths about. God, as we look to the resurrection, the day of all days, this is the ultimate truth, and it hits all three of those criteria. 
Our ultimate claim this morning is that restoration is real because Jesus rose from the dead. The Apostle John's thesis is simple. These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. That's the claim, that's the thesis, that's what we're going to work with this morning. Because Jesus rose from the dead, he is who he claimed to be, the Son of God, and this is objectively true. Now what that means is, whether you believe it or not, it happened and it's true. It's not true just because somebody in their own head believes it. It's true because it happened. It's not true then because of the wishful thinking of a bunch of simple, gullible people who believed in some cause that Jesus represented, who believed strongly enough to keep his teachings alive and start of moving. It's not true today because millions of people of all walks of life, all levels of education, all cultural backgrounds find hope, peace, and joy because of their experience with Jesus. It's not, it's true, and I want you to hear this, it's true because it really happened. It's true because it really happened that on Friday at around three o'clock in the afternoon, nearly 2,000 years ago, Jesus, a 33-year-old Jewish carpenter turned teacher from the hick town of Nazareth, died, was executed on a Roman cross. And his disciples believed that he was dead. And they went home. And they were afraid. And then on the third day, on Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene discovered that the tomb was empty. Now this is the same Mary that Jesus had healed of evil spirits about a year into his public ministry. I want you to think about that for a minute. The fact that it would be Mary Magdalene who would be the messenger. Now all across time, people have critiqued the resurrection. They said, well, what about this? What about that? What was an obstacle then was the, the fact that it were women that discovered the empty tomb. Because in this particular culture, a woman's testimony would not stand up in court. So that these babbling women had made this claim was evidence that this didn't really happen. Now what was an obstacle then is a blessing for us today. Because here's how people attack the resurrection today. They say that it was a legend that grew over time. Now here's what I want you to see this morning. If you were going to make something up over time, you wouldn't invent women to be the discoverers of the empty tomb. I want you to think about that, ponder that this morning. Some of you, as you examine the truth claims of Christ, may need to think about that a little bit more. So Mary, she ran to Peter and to John. They raced to the tomb. John is that disciple whom Jesus loved. He puts that little detail in there that he outran him. He was the first to get there, perhaps a little younger than Peter. They saw and they believed. Jesus would appear to his disciples that evening, and then he would make multiple appearances to multiple people. Many believed, but Scripture tells us that some doubted. I love that detail in there. Some doubted. There's some authenticity to that, but some doubted. Skeptics like Thomas and James and later Paul would come to believe and die for their beliefs. And this early group of Jesus' followers would turn the world upside down. Now this morning you're free to challenge my all-too-brief account but I would encourage you to take a look at the evidence for yourself. Why? The claims, the extraordinary claim, the ultimate claim that Jesus rose from the dead, it's too great a claim for you to be indifferent towards. It's too great of a claim to simply dismiss. It's too great a claim for you to have a 
moderate, no big deal response. It's just too great a claim. It's also too great to hedge your bets, to ask Jesus to forgive your sins in some emotional moment of fear and guilt, and then live your life however you please, hoping that you'll make it to heaven someday. The claim is too great. Now this morning I want to give you three simple ways that I believe the historical fact of the resurrection brings about ultimate restoration for us. And as I was thinking about all the scriptures that are around the resurrection and this truth of the resurrection, I was, I was thinking it's, in some ways it's like a greatest hits album. A greatest hits album. If, if you, and, as, and on that album, you have a favorite song. In many ways, the, the resurrection is your favorite song on the album. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you never get tired of hearing this song. You hear a few bars and, and you know the song. You hear other scriptures, other truths, some things we'll talk about today. You hear a, f- a little bit of it and you know the rest of the story. You know how it fits together. And the more you hear it, the longer you've lived, the more that you enjoy that song. Some of you, I can see it in your eyes. I can see it when you pray. I can see it when you sing that this is your favorite song and everything else pales in comparison. Others of you this morning, as you hear part of this song, whatever. So what? I've heard it before, but eh, it's no big deal. Others of you, this song may be new. Maybe I haven't heard that tune exactly that way before. Whatever the case, I want to invite you to have an open heart and an open mind as we play some of these tunes this morning. Because it indeed is the most beautiful song of all time. And it is the ultimate song, it is the ultimate truth that gives everything else meaning. So three truths this morning. The first, what was once limited to a specific people is now open to all who believe. If you've been with us for a few weeks, you know that we've been studying the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, Jesus worked through a particular family. He worked through the Jewish people. He worked through this family of Abraham that grew and grew over time. And that's primarily how he interacted. After the cross, this was opened up. This was opened up in a glorious way. So what had once been limited was now open. The Apostle Paul, one of the major skeptics of all time, who used to oppose the church, had his literal come-to-Jesus experience, was literally blinded by the light, and then he became the spokesperson for the gospel He says this in his letter to the Galatians. He says, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There is no male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. So your family tree no longer mattered. And he would go on in his letter to the church at Ephesus. He would say this, chapter 2, he would say, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus, for by grace... You have been saved through faith. That's the essence of the gospel right now. Right here. That it is open. You don't have to be born into the right family. You don't have to come from the right place or have the right track record. That is not what it is 
about. I love that we have two examples right here. If you go to the Gospel of Luke and you look at his account of the crucifixion, you see that it's the thief on the cross. Jesus is crucified in between two thieves, and one, while one thief mocks him, just as the people in the crowd do, the other says, hey, th- this man did nothing wrong. Truly, he is the Son of God, and he turns to Jesus. And with echoes of Nehemiah's prayer to remember, he says to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus did not say to him, hey, you're a thief. There's no way you can be a part of my kingdom. Clean your act up. I know that will be difficult on the cross, but clean your act up, and then you can come to me. No, he says this, today you will be with me in paradise. What a beautiful example of faith that the outcast, the thief on the cross, puts his faith and is saved. The fact that Jesus, again, would choose Mary Magdalene to be his messenger, an outcast in the community, to have had demons cast from her. Imagine what her reputation must have been as a credible witness. Today, this morning, at the the 930 service, and you'll see the video later today, we baptized Tobias and Kirsten. Wonderful to see a baptism. There's, I don't think there's anything greater on Easter Sunday to do that. But they had questions. They had doubts. They came here, and over a process of a couple years of reading the Word, asking questions, working through their doubts, they came to faith and make that public declaration through baptism today. It's a process. It's okay. It's okay to bring your doubts. It's okay to bring your questions. It's okay to take time to process Jesus Christ can handle it. It doesn't have to be a perfect faith. Jesus invites us to come as you are, to be honest before God and others about your beliefs and your doubts. You don't have to pass a test on theology, and you don't have to pass a test on morality to come to the cross. Jesus will meet you exactly where you are. And that is a wonderful truth to celebrate this morning. Number two, what was once limited to a specific place, what was once limited to a specific place is now accessible everywhere. Before the cross, again, go back to the Old Testament, place was absolutely critical. God appeared to Abraham and he promised him a place. Joshua would lead his people across the River Jordan and occupy and capture a place. And at that place there would be a tabernacle. And inside the tabernacle would be the Ark of the the Covenant. Inside the Holy of Holies. The high priest would go there once a year and offer sacrifice. That's how the system worked. Work. That's where God met his people. God was no less present everywhere, but he interacted with his people in a special place. That tabernacle, as, as the people moved into houses and, town, and, and uh, got more sophisticated and had kings, they would build a temple. And inside that temple would be the Holy of Holies, and there was a 30-foot curtain that surrounded it. And again, that high priest would go in and offer sacrifice on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. But here's the beautiful truth about the cross and the resurrection. When Jesus died on the cross, that curtain was torn from top to bottom. That curtain was torn from top to bottom. What an amazing truth. Because what was once limited to a specific place has now been opened, is now accessible everywhere. In John's account, he says this, and when he had said this, he breathed on them, this is Jesus, and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Think for a minute about the disciples, what was going through their mind? They had not processed it all yet. 
Some of you this morning, you, you've heard different things. You're wrestling with this whole deal, and you're trying to process it and put it all together. I want you to know this, this morning that the disciples were not gullible people. They believed that dead men did not rise. They had to put this together. They had to look back in Scripture. They had to analyze this and say, is this really true? I can't help but believe, as Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit. They were reminded of Jesus' words earlier, before he went to the cross. While they were still pondering it all and trying to figure it out, Jesus said this. He says, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have sorrow. I'm going to die. But he said, I will not leave you as orphans. Those were his exact words. I will not leave you as orphans orphans. I will come to you. And what he would also say is your sorrow will turn to joy. I have to go away because I can send you another one. I can send you the counselor, the comforter, your guide, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will do a lot of things. He will give you guidance. He will give you comfort. He will help you understand my words. This is a process. He also said this, He said, my Father will send you the Holy Spirit, and that Spirit will testify with your spirit that you are a child of God. And that's the truth we need to hear this morning, that you will be a child of God. So that which was just maybe theological and historical becomes personal. So what does this mean to us this morning? For one, it means that God understands Sometimes in the midst of our trials, we ask why. Why did God allow this to happen? If God is so good, so big, so powerful, then why would he allow this to happen to me or happen to somebody that I love? That's a big question. People have wrestled with that for eons. But one thing that we can say today in light of the cross, whatever your questions You can't say that God doesn't understand and that God doesn't love us because of the cross. Because guess what? On the cross, Jesus suffered everything that we do. Have you been betrayed? Have you experienced physical pain? Have you had the people closest to you turn their backs on you? Imagine the pain that Jesus experienced on the cross for his very father to forsake him and turn his back upon him. Now, if the resurrection is true, not only does God understand us, but through the Holy Spirit we have direct access to the Father. Direct access. We don't have to go into the Holy of Holies anymore. That curtain has been torn. As believers, as followers of Jesus, we are children of God. We can approach him as our Abba Father, our Dada. He hears our prayers. He cares for us. He understands. He is accessible. I want you to hear the beauty of that truth this morning. Third and finally, what was once limited by time is now eternal. Nehemiah, for all of his reforms, the Old Testament, for all the things that happened there, the restoration was temporary and it was incomplete. Nehemiah would build a wall, it would come down. He would bring reform, there would be relapse. There would be all All of the good things would fade, disappear, and be broken. John's claim, simple. These things were written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The brokenness that you have, the separation that you have, that brokenness can be healed. The the chasm that we sing about is bridged by the cross. It is a wonderful truth. 
What was once limited by time, what was once temporary, is now eternal. As you think about your own life, as you think about things that are limited and incomplete, some of you may feel that way this morning. You may feel like what you've built or tried to build is falling apart. You may believe that the hope that you once had is fleeting. Or you may believe that life is just really, really hard and difficult right now. You're in the middle of circumstances that you don't like, you don't understand. And if you're really honest with yourself, you don't know your next step. And you're, deep down, you're asking yourself the question, what does the resurrection of Jesus have to do with me today? Others of you this morning, you may feel just the opposite. You may be on top of the world. You may think, ah, I've, I've worked really hard to build something. And I'm right on track. Life may not be perfect, but it's good. I've worked really hard and I deserve what I've been given. You may be somewhere in between, but whatever the case, Jesus says to us this morning, if you believe in me, then you will have life in my name. What a glorious promise. But what does that really mean? What does that really mean this morning to say I can have life in Christ. First of all, it's the promise of eternal life. John 3:16 that's def- definitely on the favorites list of that album. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I'm, you've you've heard that song. I'm sure you've heard that song, but as you as you hear those words, We need to know that this is the declaration of the good news that Jesus has risen and defeated death. That he has defeated the power of death. Paul will say, oh death, where is your sting? It's a wonderful truth to know that Jesus Christ, through the resurrection, has defeated death. And that when we put our faith, our trust in him, we too will not perish, we too will rise. That is a glorious truth. Jesus has already secured this for you. He's already made this possible for you. But there's another part of this. There's a not yet when Jesus will return and establish his kingdom. We go to the right in the Bible on that to figure that out. We go to the end of the story where Jesus will return and establish his kingdom And in that kingdom, there will be no sin, no death. Jesus himself will wipe away every tear. All that has been broken, all the pain that has been suffered, will be healed. That is a glorious promise, but that's in the not yet. That is the day that will come. Jesus has already defeated sin and death, but there is a not yet that is to come. We live in the middle of that. In between the already and the not yet, we still experience pain. We still experience decay. We still experience sin and the consequences thereof. We are in the midst of the already, not yet. Do you feel that tension this morning? As you hold up the truth of the resurrection and the glorious promise that I will have eternal life, but yet I'm experiencing something in the middle right now that I have to hold up side by side with that truth. And I have to put the already and the not yet together. So right now we're going to do that. I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. As you think about where God has placed you right now, I'm going to give you some different opportunities to respond to the promise that I believe Jesus has for each one of us. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to bow your head and close your eyes. And I want you to think for a moment. 
I want you to think about the past week. I want you to think about John's account of the resurrection. I want you to think back to to the cross and Good Friday and what Jesus suffered on your and my behalf. I want you to think about those truths. I want you to think of the very idea that Jesus died for you and that he died for me and that your sins and my sins nailed him to the cross. And I want you to think about the glorious hope and promise of the resurrection and what Jesus offers us, that he offers us life in his name, that what was once limited to a particular people is open to us all. That was once, what was once limited to a place is now accessible and what was once temporary is now eternal. I want you to think about all those promises. But here's what I'd like you to do right now. First of all, if you're ready to follow Jesus for the first time or it's been a long time, I'd like you to stand. If you're ready to follow Jesus for the first time or it's been a long time, I would invite you to stand. I would also invite you to stand if you are praying for someone close to you to follow Jesus for the first time. If you're praying for someone to follow Jesus for the first time, I'd like you to stand. Maybe you've been praying for a long time, but there's somebody in your life, somebody you're close to, And you're praying that they will follow Jesus. So we pray together in this moment. Father, we come to you and we ask simply for each person that is represented by those standing that they will come to simple faith in you. We pray that they would simply say to you, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. That whatever obstacle to faith would be Removed. So in this moment, on behalf of my brothers and sisters, we join together and we pray for faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you continue to have your eyes closed, I would invite you to stand if you would like God to bring restoration to some area of brokenness in your life. Again, with every eye closed, if you would like God to bring restoration to some area of your life. Maybe the brokenness you're experiencing is physical. Maybe it's in a relationship. Maybe it's in an attitude or a mindset. But I'd invite you to stand. I'd also invite you to stand if you are praying for someone close to you to experience restoration. Please stand right now if you are praying for somebody close to you to experience restoration. Father, again, we come to you. I come on behalf of my brothers and sisters that you would bring restoration, that you would bring healing, that you would bring change from the inside out into each one of these lives. Father, it is in the strong name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. And finally, I would invite you to stand... Again, with eyes closed, I would invite you to stand if you are ready to take a new step towards helping someone else grow as a disciple of Jesus. And you're ready to make a change in your priorities or schedule to be used by God. Please stand if you are ready to take a new step towards helping somebody else grow as a disciple of Jesus. And you're ready to carve out time. You're ready to make a change in your priorities or your schedule to be used by God. I'd invite you to stand in this moment. Father, again, I come to you. I I thank you for the commitment represented by each of these women and men and their commitment to, to follow you and to bring others along. I pray that you would bring the right person in their life, that you would bring the right equipping, the right tools, and really the heart and the burden that says... I love somebody so much that I want to help them grow. So, Father, we know that apart from you, 
we can do nothing. I pray right now that the Spirit would move in the lives of these people, that you're going to use this group to help. And Father, it's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. This time I would invite everybody to stand. You can open your eyes now. I would like us to stand together and sing. And I mean really sing. Because the resurrection is true. It is the ultimate truth. It is the ultimate truth that brings the ultimate restoration. Let us sing together.